This is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Jen Grondal Lee. She is a debt and credit strategy attorney. She helps her clients examine their financial situations and provide long-term solutions for reducing debt and also stress in their lives. Sometimes the solution is bankruptcy, but oftentimes there are other solutions that she can work through to get people back on track. She's been featured in articles such as Consumer Affairs and US News and World Report and various websites relating to credit, debt, and bankruptcy. So welcome, Jen. Thank you, Nan. It's great to be here. Jen, are Americans in financial debt so deep that it's causing a crisis today? It's really interesting because I don't know that it's just a current phenomenon. I think it's an ongoing thing that people are financially stressed, but the problem is, is most people don't want to talk about it. And so once they get into this, the cycle of, well, no one else has these problems, then they have a lot of stress involved with that. So I see people, whether the economy is good, whether the economy is bad, stressed about debt and credit all the time. So, yes. Because they start thinking I'm the only one and that's exactly. where they really get into the stress. It, exactly. And that's why I have the elephant in the room. I always joke about the elephant in the room is that 70% of Americans have a debt or credit problem of some sort. So if you walk into a room, you can picture two thirds of the people and they're having the same problem, but no one wants to talk about it. And so it, you really feel alienated. You, you feel like, oh my gosh, if people know this about me, they're going to think I'm a horrible loser when really when they're going through the exact same or similar situations. So where really they're just in a company of like people. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what is the effect of the stress that's being created in the lives of many people across generations, which I think is really interesting. It's not just one group, but it's it's pretty much across, isn't it? It, it really is across all generations and it, it's impacting productivity. I always talk about productivity in the workplace because employers are always looking at how to make things more efficient and what should we do? And they really should be looking at the financial stress of their employees because it, it there are statistics that show that employees spend up to three hours a week on company time on their own financial problems. It also causes increase in workers' comp insurance premiums because people have accidents at work when they're stressed and they're not paying attention and they're distracted and they haven't slept. And so I see a lot of issues in the workplace where people, they're just distracted or they're spending company time on trying to get their credit fixed or trying to manage getting a mortgage when they ask for, you know, your blood sample and 17 years of big statements or something crazy like that. You're trying to rush through it. So the workplace is one area where productivity is really impacted. Relationships also tend to have a lot of issues with financial stress because we don't talk about it before we get into a relationship. A lot of times um, divorces, you know, 50% of divorces are probably related to finances. And the problem with all of the not talking about it is that it just sits there in ways and ways and ways. And then the mental impact of it affects us physically. And that's where the health side of it comes in. Um, the APA had a study out in 2014 that said that finances are the number one reason for stress. And stress creates 70% of illnesses. And so the headline on that study was, your finances are literally making you sick. Because when you worry about the finances, it really affects you physically. I've had clients over the years who've had various aches and pains, insomnia, depression, and all kinds of things that they didn't realize were all tied back to the finances. And the best stories I have is when I have clients come in after we you know, resolve the financial issues and it may take a while and they look 10 years younger and they tell me I've been sleeping better at night or I've you know been able to not have insomnia or a lot of them are not sleeping. And so I think the sleep issue is a big problem for financial stress and it's across generations. So it's, I have 75 year old clients. I have 55 year old clients. I have 30 year old clients. I have, you know, 20 year old clients. It's across generations. And some of it is because what you learn when you were 
learning about finances. So sometimes I'll have a whole family of a generation in my office where they're all having the same problems because that's what they learned how to do finances. So do you, when you were talking about productivity, do you think that people tend to spend up to the amount of income that they have? And what I'm getting at is sometimes when people get a raise, mm -hmm. they think, you think, well, maybe they would just save that extra, but isn't it true that people tend to spend up to whatever level that they have? It's that whole lifestyle creep. Yes. And you look back at your own life and you look back to when you were making, you know, $10 an hour and how you were able to pay rent and you were able to still do all those things. And then as you got raises over the years, your lifestyle does start creeping up. You may need a, you think you need a larger house or bigger cars, or it, it does creep up. Most people don't save that difference when they start getting raises or they switch jobs to get a higher salary. And that's, it's a big problem. We're not taught that. So I always tell my clients, it's not, I'm not trying to blame people. There's no reason to blame anyone. It's, you have to solve it. And so that education part of it is really important. That's really important because, you know, you think, uh, if you keep spending up to the amount that you have and then you start going over it and then you get into debt, if it causes all of these additional problems, boy, is it really worth it? You know, right. what you exactly. thought, is it really worth it? You know? It's hard though, because you want to keep up with those around you. It's, you know, who you're hanging out with and you want to, yeah. I, I don't like to use the Joneses, but they're, they're the common term out there is keeping up with them. So how do you think people can better understand their credit score? First, they should know their credit score. So a lot of people who are stressed about their finances won't check their credit because they're afraid of what they will see. It's kind of like the head in the sand. And so there are, and I do a lot of studies and numbers because I, I like evidence for things. And there are studies that show you have a higher credit score if you actually check your credit score because you're paying attention then to what affects your credit score. And most of the time, there is a lot of, there are a lot of small things you can do to fix your credit score to make it better, but there is so much bad information out there, especially on the internet of how to fix credit scores and scams that getting that education is really important on credit scores and knowing actually what you should do versus what some person on TikTok may have recommended you do. So the numbers, um, like 850, if I, is that a pretty good score? It seems like <laughs> 800s it were. Yeah. So there are about 300 different credit scoring systems out there in America. Mm -hmm. And so people don't realize that they think, oh, my credit score is 750 and that's it. I'm like, no, you have all kinds of different credit scores, depending on who's running it, what agency is backing it, all kinds of different things. And most of the credit scores go from 350 to 850. There are some that go from 300 to 900. There are a few in there, but generally speaking, it's like the 350 to 850 range is what we're looking at for credit scores. And a good credit score is the one that you have that gets you what you need. So I always tell people, you don't have to worry about having a perfect credit score, but what are your goals and what credit score do you need to hit that goal? If you need to get a mortgage for a house and they tell you your credit score needs to be 680, then anything above 680 is a good credit score. So I always tell people, look at your goals versus look at what society tells you as a good credit score. That seems like really good advice. You know, we have dealt and with and heard a lot about identity theft. Mm -hmm. What should people do to avoid identity theft? So identity theft is very prevalent out there. I do all kinds of talks on it because almost everyone has had their identity stolen at some point. It's just the extent of what that person used it for. And so many times locking down your credit so that people can't open up cards, you can you can request that your credit be frozen. If you're not applying for credit, it doesn't affect anything that you're really doing, but it makes people not be able to open up accounts in your name if they run your credit. So that's one thing that I often tell people. I also usually recommend that if you have minor children, that you lock their credit when they're born because the most valuable social security number on in the thief world is a six month old's social security mm -hmm. number because you don't know for 18 years that it's been stolen. Oh my God. Because you never, you're not using it. You're not running your credit like you normally would. And so I tell people all the time, lock your children's credit score, credit reports so that, that 
they don't have identity theft and have to deal with that as soon as they turn 18. Um, and then basic things, passwords, use two-factor identification, uh, authentication on things, and don't throw your mail out with all personal identif identifying information. So there's a lot of basic things out there that you can do to avoid identity theft, but it can happen to anyone. It really can. I've had my credit card stolen. I've had, and I take a lot of precautions. So it really can happen to anyone. Well, and you do see every once in a while, you get an email because I do everything through LifeLock. Yep. And I do see emails where it says, there's been a data breach and everybody with this particular thing is probably compromised. Right. Yep. That's scary. <laughs> it's very scary. Yes. And that's why that's why you should check your credit and why you should monitor monitor it yourself and not, you can rely on a company like LifeLock or I'm not, a, I don't promote any specific companies, mm -hmm. but um, using those tools are great, but checking it yourself there's no substitute for checking it yourself and making sure that everything on there is accurate. So, well, and you get worried with more and more of your financial data online, yes. you know, where you, it's so handy to have your bank online. It's so handy to deposit a check yeah. online, all these things that you wonder if some, somebody eventually is going to get into them. You know, yeah. Scary. yeah. It happens. Yeah. What actions should people take then if their identity has been stolen or and actually used someplace? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that they should do is they should notify whatever bank or whatever has been, whatever in institution, let them know that it's either identity theft or an unauthorized account, getting the information out there. Also freezing your credit or alerting of, of doing a fraud alert on all your credit reports, TransUnion, Experian, Equifax are really important because then it puts this red flag out there to the world that says, hey, something has gone on. We should probably check, double check on other things. The FTC also has a really good identity theft guide. So I always recommend the identity theft report and they tell you exactly what to do and who to report it to. And also don't discount police reports. So a lot of people think, oh, it's identity theft. They're not going to do anything for it. And it's not so much that the police are going to do something, but it creates a paper trail so that if you need to dispute something or you need to use that for a future issue that you have, you have a police report for it. And emails, it seems like are important because today I got an email saying from PayPal saying that there has been a charge of a Nikon camera. Yeah on my PayPal. And all they really want me to do is click on the link. Yes. yes. And, don't click on anything. That's what I tell and, you. And it almost it. got me because yeah. I thought, what? I didn't charge anything like that to PayPal. Yep. So what you do is what I did at least is go directly into yep. PayPal and look and say, is there something there? Yeah, exactly. Yes. You should never click on a link that's sent to you in an email, go to the provider's website and log in or call the number on the back of your card. Don't call whatever number they give you in a text message. Um, don't click on any links from text messages either, unless you're, are, you know, it's a standard thing that you've seen before, but I tell people all the time, don't click on things. At what point should people contact you for assistance? So I'm technically a bankruptcy lawyer. That's what my, my background is. And I, what I found over the years was that so many people could have used help before they got to the point of bankruptcy. So my red flags or my warning signs are usually you're making minimum payments on credit cards, but you're not ever able to make more than minimum payments that you're you know living paycheck to paycheck. You don't have any savings, but you have debt that's kind of weighing on you. Um, I always tell people that if you're worried about your finances, that that's a good time to call. Even if you think, oh, I don't have very much debt or I don't know, we can always do a credit report review. We can always figure out whether things are looking good or looking bad, kind of like a status update versus waiting until it's an emergency. Like I had someone who called and said, I have a foreclosure tomorrow. What can I do? Right. So I would prefer people, you know, be proactive about it. But I also understand that you don't want to look at it. You don't want to face it. And it's really common. It's a psychological thing. And so the sooner, the better, but I'm also here if things get down to the point where there's a foreclosure tomorrow. And then what do you provide to them? Sure. So we do what we call them strategy sessions, and it depends on what the client's needs are. Sometimes it's student loan. 
space where we're looking just at a student loan issue because those have their own things. Sometimes it's just a debt strategy where we're trying to figure out, can you budget out? Are there other options for this debt? Um, please don't listen to late night television commercials telling you what you can do with your debt because that's what I see a lot of those. And then bankruptcy a lot of times tends to be a really good option for people that that B word scares them. They're like, oh my God, that's the most horrible thing. When really bankruptcy often improves your credit score. You qualify for mortgage lending one year after bankruptcy. There's all kinds of things you can do if you have the right information. So most of our sessions are based on providing education and information so that you can make good decisions versus swirling around in the unknown and making bad decisions because of bad information. So. Well, your primary focus is on helping individuals and businesses uh, understand their rights yep. when it comes to debit and credit. And I saw that you have a podcast like I do here I do. and a blog. I do. So tell us about those. How can people find them? Sure. And then what else you might have available? Sure. I, so I do have a podcast. It's called Debt Therapy. And it's very small pieces of information that financial stuff that we wish we would have been taught when we were kids, but we never really were. And so a lot of it is just five to 10 minutes of a financial tip. Or if I keeping the same question over and over, I'll do an episode of debt therapy. It's not as regular as a lot of other podcasts are. It's more based on what's out there in the economy right now. And then the blog, we do have a blog um, on our website and the blog is genlylaw.com as our, our website. And a lot of times that is based on stories and things that we hear people come in and, and we hear from clients. Of course, the client information isn't out there, but it's very common. And I want people to identify themselves when they see stories out there that aren't ridiculous stories. Like I just, there's crazy financial stories out there. The crypto market these days has also been driving me crazy because of all the cryptocurrency bankruptcies. <laughs> um, but a lot of information. And I also have a, we have YouTube channel. We have all kinds of things because I want people to find information in the way that it works for them and not the way traditionally lawyers write a lot. We do a lot of writing and most people like 80% of people prefer video or sound. So I try to accommodate all those different so let's give everybody all of your mm -hmm. links. So you said law.com? Genlylaw.com. So just okay. my name, genlylaw.com. Yep. And then you said for your Debt podcast therapy. name? Debt therapy. Okay. And then for your YouTube channel? That's Genly Law as well. Yep. All right. That is great. So are there any takeaways that you really, really want people to remember from today's interview? Mostly I want people to remember that they're not alone and that this isn't an embarrassing thing. It's a, let's just get it solved so that you can move on with your life thing. Because most of the time people wait too long and then that the stress, years and years of stress. And so we can avoid all of that. So you're not alone. There's help out there, but get good information so you can make good decisions. Well, Jen, this has been so helpful. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. This is you I did just a like great job informing people, and you will be in three different places. You okay. they can find your information on from our website, but they can find your information on our website under your guest profile. Okay. They can find your information and what you said on the podcast, Trailblazers Impact. And then we have two YouTube channels, and I believe you qualify for both. One is Troublazers Impact Interviews, and the other one is Significance After 60. Mm -hmm. So I think those are all the places they can find you, plus the ones that you gave. So thank you so much for participating with us today and sharing that information. It was great. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it.